One category at the Academy Awards that has proven pivotal in introducing films to people is Best Documentary Feature. It's helped elevate the voices of a number of directors making documentaries, and the winners have tackled a wide variety of topics. While certainly not without its controversies, it's good that the category exists to honor non-fiction films. The idea of creating a category awarding documentaries came about due to World War II, and the important films being made that preserve those images. In 1941, the Academy gave special awards to photographer Ray Scott for his documentary, Kukan, and to the British Ministry of Information for the Royal Air Force film, Target for Tonight. This led to the creation of a new category the following year. Four films actually won in that inaugural year, all focused on different events in the war. John Ford's The Battle for Midway, Kenji Hall's Kokoda Frontline, Frank Capra's Prelude to War, and the Soviet documentary Moscow Strikes Back. Made at a time when newsreels were included as part of the theater bill, these films were seen by a significant number of viewers, and showed the power of the still young art form of cinema. Documentaries about the war and the military continued to win in the category throughout the 40s, but in the 50s, interest among Academy voters started to shift towards nature films. Walt Disney's True Life Adventure series won multiple Oscars, and other prominent producers whose documentaries triumphed here included Irwin Allen and the famous oceanographer Jacques V. Cousteau. There were also Oscar-winning biographies on Michelangelo, Helen Keller, and Albert Schweitzer. In the 60s, a wide assortment of topics were explored in the winters, although documentaries about war, animals, and extraordinary people remained popular. Some still very highly regarded and important documentaries took home the trophy in the 70s. Woodstock, the landmark over three-hour chronicle of the famous music festival, not only won the Oscar for Best Documentary, but also became the first documentary to be nominated for Best Film Editing which additionally marked legendary editor Thelma Schoonmaker's first nomination. Woodstock was also honored with a sound nomination, recognizing the film's impressive audio preservation of the musical performances. Other notable winners in the 70s included The Hellstrom Chronicle, a doomsday prediction of insects outliving humans, Hearts and Minds, which showed an unflinching portrait of the Vietnam War, Harlan County, USA, which centers on a minor strike in a small Kentucky town, and Scared Straight, about the programs used to prevent juvenile delinquents from committing more crimes. The documentary feature category would eventually evolve into honoring films focused on serious issues, as the filmmakers attempt to bring them to a wider audience. Winners in the 80s touched on the treatment of Native Americans, the career of gay rights activist and politician Harvey Milk, the Holocaust, and the AIDS crisis. However, in the late 80s and 90s, the Best Documentary Feature category would start to receive scrutiny for not nominating some high-profile films. Errol Morris's The Thin Blue Line was a widely acclaimed documentary, whose findings actually freed a man who had been wrongfully imprisoned. However, the Academy ruled it ineligible due to the use of reenactments. Michael Moore's first film, Roger and Me, similarly got a lot of attention for a documentary, grossing over $7 million, only to not get nominated. The outcry over the category got further media attention in 1994. That year saw the release of two highly praised documentaries, Crumb, about the underground cartoonist Robert Crumb, and Hoop Dreams, centering on the aspiring basketball careers of two teenagers. These appeared on several critics' Best of the Year lists, with Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert especially championing Hoop Dreams. Despite their popularity, neither film was nominated for Best Documentary, although Hoop Dreams did receive an editing nomination. This led to further criticism of the Documentary Selection Committee, which often consisted of retirees, and they were accused of favoring films with standard talking head interviews and turning their noses up at more experimental and risk-taking documentaries. One problem that was found was the bizarre voting system. Rather than ranking their favorites, like in most other categories, the documentary nominees were decided via a scoring system. The issue is that a film could be given top scores, but still end up losing the nomination if others gave it low marks, and that was what reportedly hurt Hoop Dreams. Shortly after this, the Academy decided to change the voting process, although it would take until 2001 for an actual documentary branch to be created. Oscar-winning documentaries continued to focus on serious subject matter, with World War II being the most common. The 2000s was a decade when the documentary exploded in popularity, and probably aided by the newly incorporated voting process, successful box office hits ended up doing well in the category. Michael Moore won the Oscar for Bowling for Columbine, his documentary on gun control, although, as is often the case with Moore, there were questions about how his editing manipulated events. March of the Penguins was a surprise summer sleeper hit in 2005, grossing over $77 million at the North American box office, and helped propel it towards an Oscar. 
An Inconvenient Truth, a film version of Al Gore's presentation warning of the dangers of global warming, was another movie that garnered a lot of attention from an audience that normally doesn't watch documentaries. I remember climate change and environmental protection being a major topic of discussion that year, so it was little surprise when An Inconvenient Truth won the Oscar. Not all money-making docs were nominated, though. Despite being the highest-grossing documentary of all time and one of the most talked-about films of 2004, Fahrenheit 9-11 was not able to translate its box office dollars into Oscar gold. There are rules that prohibited submitted documentaries from being shown on television in a certain time frame. Michael Moore wanted Fahrenheit to air on television before the 2004 election to further prevent George W. Bush's re-election. So he decided to forget about the Best Documentary category and try to go for Best Picture instead. Bush wound up winning a second term as president, and Fahrenheit 9-11 got zero nominations. Must have been a rough couple of months for Mr. Moore. The 2010s saw the category continue to evolve. There was suddenly a trend of documentaries about entertainers, namely musicians, doing well, with Searching for Sugar Man, 20 Feet from Stardom, and Amy winning. Although here's something surprising about the Best Documentary category. You would think a voting group comprised of filmmakers would want to award documentaries about movie making. And yet films looking at the making of movies are rarely nominated. Oh, a few have occasionally gotten in, like documentaries about Citizen Kane, screenwriter Waldo Salt, composer Bernard Herrmann, and The Hollywood Blacklist. There was also Life Animated, a touching documentary about the impact of Disney animated films on a young autistic man. Otherwise, it's rare. Life Itself, about the life of Roger Ebert, Waking Sleeping Beauty, about the rise of the 90s Disney Renaissance, and This Film Is Not Yet Rated, an expose on the MPA rating system, did not get nominated, among several other documentaries about movies. The Academy is often accused of loving movies about Hollywood, but I guess that does not apply to the people voting for Best Documentary. The category also became home to the longest Oscar-winning film in history, when O.J. made an American one. Running a little under eight hours, it was produced by ESPN, premiered at Sundance, and had the necessary qualifying theatrical run. It then aired as a five-part miniseries on television. This then led to the question of whether Made in America should count as a movie or whether it was a docu-series. The Academy apparently had similar concerns of the precedent this might set. Thus, after the film won the Oscar, they changed the rules so that similar docu-series could not be eligible. Speaking of awards eligibility, something that producers had been doing for a while were submitting films for both Oscars and Emmys. This resulted in documentaries being nominated for the two awards, with Made in America, Free Solo, and American Factory even winning. So the organization responsible for the Emmys changed their own rules and have told documentary producers they now have to choose between submitting for an Oscar or an Emmy. They're not allowed to compete for both, which I think is fair. Even with streaming now blurring the lines of what defines a movie, there should still be a distinction when it comes to these specific award shows. Speaking of streaming, Netflix has recently become a major player in the Best Documentary Feature Oscar. They have helped popularize the documentary among viewers, and for the efforts they have won this award three of the last four years, winning for Icarus, American Factory, and most recently My Octopus Teacher. It's an example of the changing landscape of distribution and exhibition, and looking at the history of the documentary Oscar certainly provides a snapshot of the growth of nonfiction filmmaking. Among the documentaries that have won, been nominated, and even been overlooked, you'll certainly find plenty of informative gems. See you next time.